I'm Benjamin Thomas. I'm here to present Gene Break, an approach towards CRISPR-based gene drives. Um, just a way that the U.S. can defend itself against an unintended or misused gene drive construct that can perhaps drive itself from the population that could be either detrimental or it could be beneficial, it's just unintended or misused. And here's in a way that we can perhaps reverse or stop this spread of whatever gene into the environment. The gene break presentation will be broken up into the following categories. We'll start with insects and their role in biowarfare. We can go from the concerns of the public we can also talk about the gene break system, how it's constructed, how do we plan to implement it, and then what is the origin of the gene break itself. And then a risk assessment will be done or showed that basically talks about the risk versus the benefits and whether the benefits can outweigh the risk and then what risk are there even potentially there. And then I will talk about how if we we're given funding, how will the funding be broken down into individual categories. I'll start this presentation off with introducing a piece of literature, Six-Legged Soldiers, written by Jeffrey A. Lockwood. And the story goes into giving detailed examples about entomological warfare, so warfare involving insects. And it goes from talking about using buckets of scorpions during sieges, we can talk about catapulting beehives over a fortress. Um, and in other ways that humans were basically guinea pigs as other countries were weaponizing plagues. And it just gives many sides of how insects could potentially be used in bio warfare or biological warfare or entomological warfare. And it gives three different types of entomological warfare that could possibly be incorporated, such as using insects directly to affect humans maybe as a vector for transmitting diseases like malaria or Zika or dengue, or potentially using insects as agricultural pests and introducing them into another environment to where they can destroy a country's food crops, like potentially sending locusts out to a place where they're not supposed to be at and having them decimate a country's crops. Continuing off of that, insects are capable of traveling long distances. They can also reach places that humans cannot reach with pesticides. Um, they're able to reproduce quickly, a male and a female potentially producing hundreds of embryos. And they also have the ability to vector debilitating pathogens, bloodborne diseases. We could start with a scenario to kind of show how a simple vector that affects countries already can be modified to do even more damage. And we can start with Aedes, a, a species that I guess most people are familiar with as they can vector dengue, chikungunya, Zika virus, and all the other diseases. Now, we have Aedes aegypti, we also have Aedes albopictus, and both of these species are known to cause economic burden and also cause morbidity the state of being diseased and also mortality, the state of being dead in many countries, including subtropical and tropical regions. So here's a graph displaying the global burden of major vector-borne diseases in 2017. All right, so we see the mosquitoes are at the top of this list, causing malaria, dengue, lymphatic filariasis, chikungunya, zika virus, yellow virus, Japanese encephalitis, West Nile fever, a list. And there's also like the black flies, the sand flies. There's also the triantamines. And these numbers are quite alarming as mosquitoes can affect millions of people yearly. And these are annual cases. Like we see, for example, in particular, we see that malaria causes 212 million cases per year and the number of deaths is almost half a million people yearly and then we see here that with dengue we see similar trends that people die and people are affected and we see that the estimated annual disability of life years is over a million and so now this causes an economic burden because these people are being are diseased 
or they're dying and this would hinder their contributions to the economy and then that message is also seen in lymphatic psoriasis chikungunya zika every disease on this list and someone using crispr cas9 could potentially modify these uh, vectors to be even more disruptive so here's a graph that shows the economic burden that dengue places on in Mexico. Dengue, a disease that's transmitted by a vector by Aedes aegypti. Now we can see that these are all represented by millions. On the bottom x-axis we see that dengue annual cost and on the y-axis we see what the money was actually used for. For medical purposes we see that 64 million dollars is just alone in 2010 was used for dengue related things and in 2011 we see a reduction at 34 million even though it's a reduction that's still a lot of money that is being placed on specifically one disease and then we see an alarming number of alarming number of money that's being used on specifically surveillance and vector control and now we see that with the the reduction in the medical expenses in 2011 there was also a raise in the amount of vector control and surveillance that was being used, which would make sense. But still, the point of the matter is that a lot of money is being put towards combating dengue in these areas and controlling the population, but that's still an economic burden. And this could be further raised if someone was to misuse biotechnology to modify these vectors. Here is a figure of the prevalence of the Aedes species in the U.S. And so we see that Aedes aegypti is particularly concentrated in the south, and we also see that Aedes albopictus is particularly concentrated in the south, where their transmission is most uh, found, most likely found. So, what if someone with CRISPR-Cas9 or whatever biotechnology could potentially modify these mosquitoes to move westward? or northern or spread to New York, same with Aedes albopictus. This would not only increase their potential range but also increase their transmission rate, raising the chances of them transmitting a bloodborne pathogen such as dengue or Zika virus or other viruses that are of concern to the U.S. medically. So continuing off the potential range of Aedes and how that could be modified we can also talk about climate change and how that affects the AD species as well. So this is a figure that projects a 1 billion people to be at risk by 2080 of hosting a mosquito-borne disease under extreme global warming. So not only climate change can affect how these mosquitoes are distributed across the United States and around the world, but also human intrusion into habitats maybe uncontrolled urbanization, such as the rapid building of infrastructures. They can also be the absence of safe uh, water supplies available. Maybe there's poor sewage treatment in the area, wastewater disposal, um, and also birds changing their migration patterns can also lead to the, the change in the distribution of 80s around the world, which would also contribute to more people being at risk for these mosquito-borne diseases. And this risk can be potentiated or raised by the use of CRISPR-Cas9 or whatever gene modifying tool. So we talked about climate and how mosquitoes can move around in their environment and how any of these things could be potentially detrimental to the population. But now we can talk about how Aedes could be modified to become a better vector of disease, something that they're already known to be good at. So here's VC. VC indicates the ability of a, an organism to be a vector. And so we can com mathematically compute their ability to become a vector. Now, <clears throat> looking at the vector hosted density, perhaps Aedes could be modified to be able to reproduce more, produce more embryos, more eggs, and have more offspring. Having more mosquitoes hatch from these embryos or offspring could potentially raise the amount of mosquitoes that are, are, that are in the environment and raise the amount of females that are wanting to bite, you know, animals or humans. 
and then therefore raise the chances of a disease being transmitted from the mosquito to whatever host. Now, the, mo the feeding frequency of the mosquito can also be modified to where they will want to get receive blood meals or feed off of organisms more, which would also raise the chances of a bloodborne pathogen being transmitted as well. Mosquitoes can also be modified to be more competent at receiving a vector, more susceptible to being infected, or maybe more, more able to house this organism or parasite or virus. And then that will lead us right into the extrinsic incubation period or the period of time that's needed for the parasite or virus to basically replicate and grow and divide within the mosquito's stomach or the mythga. And that could potentially be uh, raised so the mosquito would be able to receive the pathogen and ship the pathogen even faster, which would make it to where more people can be infected by this mosquito. Now we see in the denominator lifespan and if someone can modify the mosquito to have a longer lifespan, then that would in turn raise their victorial comp their victorial competence, their, their ability to vector disease. As they live longer, they'll have more opportunities to mate, more opportunities to lay eggs more opportunities to bite individuals and potentially transmit whatever pathogen, whether that be a virus, whether that be a parasite, whatever, to this organism. All of these different things can modify the mosquito's ability to vector diseases, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to drive through a population. So first we can start off with how can we engineer vector populations? So we can start with the three different types of ways you can engineer vector populations. You can use target site cleavage based gene drive systems. There's also toxin antidote based gene drive systems. And then there's also translocation based drives. The one we are looking at specifically and the one I am here to present to y'all today as a defense would be a CRISPR Cas9 based drive. That is site specific, but we'll go into further details of that later. Zinc finger ZFNs essentially means zinc finger uh, nucleases, talons, transcription activator length, effector nucleases, um, HEGs, homing endonucleases genes, and then there's also TEs, transposable elements. Um, each of these types of drives. Uh, are gonna come with their downsides, like ZFNs and the talons are gonna be uh, more expensive. HEGs are hard to come by as they're found naturally and it's hard to re-engineer them. But CRISPR-Cas9 is um, very diverse with what it can affect and is more popular in some laboratories now because of its relative cost to the other methods and also its site specificity. Now, with the toxin anecdote based gene drive system, it's basically um, two organisms can come together, but they need to make sure that you always have the toxin and the anecdote. That's not particularly discussed in this uh, PowerPoint, but it all, it's, it's a very effective method, but it's not going to be able to stop someone if they were to use CRISPR-Cas9 for unintended purposes or misuse. And I'll go further into that later. And then there's translocation-based drives where you can use something called underdominance, where a heterozygote would not be favored in the population and therefore be phased out or die. But for now, we're gonna focus specifically with CRISPR-Cas9. So here is an image of CRISPR-Cas9. And you see that Cas9 is a protein that is gonna be the molecular scissors that cut the DNA. And Cas9 doesn't just do this without direction. It needs the direction of a guide RNA, hence the name. And it has a sequence that is from 17 to 20 nucleotides that 
guide the cast mind to a target sequence to be cut. But a one drawback or requirement for this is obviously the 17 to 20 nucleotide uh, target sequence and also a PAM site. And a PAM site is basically stands for proto-adjacent uh, proto motif. And then a PAM site has an NGG, NGG sequence where it has to start with any nucleotide, but you also need that GG in addition to the 17 to 20 nucleotide uh, target sequence. Now, there's a CRNA and there's also the TRCRRNA, and these are just basically there for stability. But you can think about CRISPR-Cas9 as a mailman delivering a product. And so you can think about the guide RNA as UPS guiding its mail, which is the Cas9 to wherever it needs to be dropped off at. And it's very site specific. And that's one of another drawback with CRISPR-Cas9 as there could be repetitive sequences in the DNA, but that will be discussed later on. So once this CRISPR-Cas9 is guided by the guide RNA to wherever it needs to make a cut at, a double-stranded break will occur once the Cas9 cleaves. Now, once DNA breaks, there are several different DNA repair pathways that will, want, that will then be activated and compete with each other essentially for the repair of this broken DNA. Now, on this slide, I only show two different types of repair pathways, even though there's probably many more, but here are the dominant ones. So we have the error-prone or considered error-prone process of non-homologous end-joining or NHEJ-mediated repair. The repair of these uh, separate strands involve the use of chemicals like DNA PKCs or Q70, Q80 proteins, but there's a varying amount of proteins that come together and essentially combine the DNAs once again, the DNA strands, and create variable indels, meaning insertions or deletions of nucleotides. So this process is not exactly favorable if you're trying to bring in a gene into a population or an organism and have it be exactly as expected. This will come with frame shifts that occur from these insertions or deletions. And these frame shifts can cause silent mutations, they can cause mutations that can make different proteins and they can cause proteins that uh, it can cause mutations that can make premature stop codons, which will lead to a truncated protein. And these are all not favorable. Now, on the other spectrum, on the other side, we have HDR. HDR stands for homology directed repair. Now, homology directed repair would use basically one of the strands as a template, and we'll have a donor template. And then it will lead to precise sequence modification. Now, you see on this donor template that we have homology arms. These match the same color as these. And this end of the donor template matches these. And this will be the, basically the uh, template that will be copied into this double-stranded break to repair. Now, we notice this green bar here, and then that's basically the gene of interest that we're trying to introduce into this organism. And using homology-directed repair, we can get this target sequence into the organism without any unexpected indels, insertions, or deletions, making HDR a favorable pathway to use when using CRISPR-Cas9. But even if you use CRISPR-Cas9, that doesn't automatically mean that a, that gene will drive through the population. So if we look at the left side, we have an altered gene here that is gonna be spread through normal inheritance. Now we have this altered allele, say we use CRISPR-Cas9 with the HDR pathway being used, and it just mates with a wild-type mosquito. Now, 
knowing our classic Mendelian inheritance, it has a 25% chance of being spread through the population as this altered allele is only on one. Now it has a 25% chance of getting through the population. Boom to boom, boom to boom, boom to boom. It's not really in this population. Because as we see in the bottom, there's only one out of like eight of these organisms that actually has it. There's a 50% chance of passing this altered gene via normal inheritance. And so how can we even solve that? Through the propagation or the continuation of a selected gene or trait, as we'll see with a phenomenon known as gene drive. A gene that is able to selfishly ensure its continuation through a whole population. And so with gene drive, we, here we have a mosquito with the gene drive construct mating with a wild type. And we can break it down to a molecular level. We see that there's a Cas9 gene. We see that there's a guide RNA gene that's going to basically code for a guide RNA to guide this newly coded Cas9 gene. And we also have the altered allele that wants to be transferred. And so now with all these components essentially being on this mosquito, it can make its own Cas9, it can make its own guide RNA, and it can also make its own altered allele. That's this cargo. And so when it codes this guide RNA, and also this Cas9, it leads to a cut of the wild type allele. And assuming that homology directed repair occurs, then you have two alleles now that are exactly the same with both the Cas9, the guide RNA, and also the altered allele. And so if this gene drive mosquito was ever to mate with another wild type again, then we will see that same pattern as displayed at the very bottom. So we have this altered mosquito mating with the wild type and that 50% chance inheritance. There's no chance that the gene drive will not work unless it was maybe a different DNA repair pathway. But we see that every time it mates with a wild type, there's at least some that have this construct. And as the generations continue, we see that there's all gene-driven mosquitoes. And then that's an example of how a gene drive can perpetuate or continuate throughout the population. Knowing now more about CRISPR-Cas9 gene drive and how the two can be combined, we now have dual use concerns or concerns of people either using them for good or people using them for bad. And for bad presents lots of concerns, especially with the public, as people such as the biohackers misuse CRISPR-Cas9 or they're misinformed and they still use it and they misinform others, which could lead to this trend of people using CRISPR-Cas9 for under and the unintended purposes. But that just leads you to wonder what other countries or individuals have uh, malicious intent on using CRISPR-Cas9. CRISPR-Cas9 has a wide range of targets, and but the limitations are that CRISPR-Cas9 can only be used in sexually reproducing species, so they can't be used in viruses, they can't be used in bacteria, and the fact that you need to have a PAM site that NGG and they also need a unique 17 to 20 nucleotide retarget. And they cannot be repetitive sequences that you're targeting. Or there'll be a, a cascade of off-target effects where CRISPR-Cas9 can cut at multiple locations. So with CRISPR-Cas9 based gene drives, so it could be used for good, right? And say if a country was conducting field trials using CRISPR-Cas9 based gene drives to control an 80s mosquito population, an 80s Egypti population to be specific, and they're releasing them at thousands within their field trial. Now, what's stopping these mosquitoes from migrating to different areas? We've seen in multiple studies that people, you know, release a lot of mosquitoes and there's always migration within their population charts. Now, what if some of these 80s Egyptian mosquitoes, gene-driven, drifted or dr migrated into different countries going across borders? Now, we have international conflicts 
caused by this CRISPR-Cas9 based gene drive. And there's not really any safeguards for the countries to reverse or stop this spread in that this CRISPR-Cas9 based gene drive, if it goes awry or like there's lots of mistakes or maybe there's off target effects that no one anticipated, then that can cause irreversible changes to the ecosystem. And then that's also quite scary and it causes concerns from the public. And so with all these concerns, it just leads people to not want to pursue this technology if there's no safeguards in place. And say if a natural disaster was to occur, or maybe the caretaker of the whatever organism was careless or negligent, then these can also lead to unintentional releases that could potentially drive through an environment. What's going to be in place to stop CRISPR-Cas9 based gene drive organisms? So now I can reveal what gene break is and our purpose in this project, which would be to inactivate Cas9. No Cas9, which, mean, which would mean no drive. Cas9 are the scissors, and if we take away the scissors, then there is no perpetuation of this whatever gene that is being, uh, that is modifying the wild type genome. And so inspirations for the gene break arose from a paper called Cas9 Triggered Chain Ablation of Cas9 as a Gene Break. It was written by Bing Wu, Mingun Wu, Xiao Jing, Jie Gao. And basically they developed a potential Cas9 based gene drive break that remains inert in the wild type population, but is activated by the presence of CRISPR-Cas9. It needs CRISPR-Cas9 to essentially function. And there's a construct for Kasha, which stands for Cas9 Triggered Chain Ablation. And here is their construct. Their construct encodes for a guide RNA around here with the U6 promoter. And this guide RNA is going to be flanked by two sequences of Cas9 that essentially create homology arms. These homology arms are important because this is how we're going to be able to incorporate this construct into the mosquitoes uh, or whatever organism's genome that depends. Now, in addition to all of that, we're also going to have an HDR enhancing effector gene right around here. Now, there's multiple studies that show that there's ways to boost HDR repair in certain organisms. And then that will be the most uh, challenging part of the research if we're funded. There's ways where you can downregulate certain proteins or genes and upregulate the chances of a homology directed repair. Abilities to upregulate this or raise the chances of this occurring would make this construct and other forms of genetically modifying things more efficient. In addition to that, we're also going to put an eye marker gene. An eye marker gene to essentially allow whatever factory workers that we would need of whatever organism to essentially know which ones have this construct within them. So here is the process of catch up, or in this case, gene break. Let me draw in the the eye gene, whatever eye color that may be, and we'll also draw on the HDR component. Let me change the color on that. All right, we'll just call that the HDR component. And so in this construct, we have the homology arms present here, right? We have the homology arms, the homology arms, and it also is the same color as the Cas9 um, gene. And so now we have a template for homology directed repair to occur. Now coming from this construct, uh, we also have the Cas9 guide RNA that will be coding essentially the guide RNA that will guide whatever Cas9 that is already present within the organism to go ahead and cleave. Right? 
So it codes for this guide RNA. It's in an organism already with Cas9 already present. It grabs this Cas9 and guides it to where it needs to cleave at. And so once it cleaves, the DNA needs to repair itself, right? And so we have these constructs that present these homology arms. Now that's incorporated along with the guide RNA. And we have what we see here at the bottom on the left side. We see that we have the homology arms that were incorporated as well as the guide RNA that was incorporated. And we can test the quality of our work or the quality of integration by essentially using primers that are designed to bind to these areas of the DNA. And we can test that through a PCR or through high throughput sequencing. And we can see if the organism truly has this construct to test if that works. And the people of this paper, being Wu, specifically done that. They have the primers and they also tested it out by working in Drosophila using uh, basically a CRISPR-Cas9 based uh, component that's lethal to the Drosophila. And they were able to save the Drosophila by using Kacha or in this case, gene break. And so on the right side, we see the same thing, but on two alleles. And we see that an allele, uh, a heterozygote carrying Kacha codes for that guide RNA, and it will grab the Cas9 and essentially convert both of the alleles to having Kacha in this construct of this guide RNA still present. That's still encoding for this guide RNA to keep guiding more Cas9s. So it's going to be transported over time. So one might ask, why should we go with this method over others? I mean, there's other methods that could be used to stop gene drives. For instance, maybe we can uh, make more vaccines that could combat whatever organism that is potentially vectoring a disease. Um, we can also repress the population, suppress the population by using sterile insect technique, SIT. You can also suppress and replace the population by using Wolbachia that's been proven to be effective in California, Florida, Australia, Vietnam. You can also use endosymbiotic organisms. Point being, there's a lot of different methods that can be used to either replace the population or suppress the population. But which of these methods is actually going to stop a Cas9 protein from cutting the DNA of the organism and modifying this organism? With the gene break, the benefit of it is if, if there is no drive there, no gene drive there, it would eventually fade out of the population as it theoretically would not be providing any benefits for the organism. And saying that or understanding that concept would prove to be good for human values because who is going to want a genetically modified organism in nature forever? This method could potentially lead back to the wild type population being restored. Especially if more wild type organisms of whatever um, organism was released back into the population. So say if there was um, an 80s Egypti population that was affected by a CRISPR-based uh, gene drive modification. Gene break was released. It stops the Cas9 from driving over the population over a couple generations. But now we have a bunch of inactivated Cas9s in these organisms that are perhaps affecting its fitness. We could then release wild type 80s Egypti from maybe a bank or maybe from another state into this population to potentially revert the colony or population back to wild type completely. It leads me into how it could be applied in the field. So people, we can have maybe agencies or maybe a factory that has monitoring of the neighboring populations of whatever organism. So we can monitor uh, perhaps predators that target the species. We can target also competitors whose diet overlap. We can also monitor species who are cl closely linked 
to the target species, maybe a relative. And PCR testing of sampling of the environment can also be done in certain populations where maybe reports of surges in populations are occurring. And we can check non-target species, closely related species. We can also check that species with uh, PCR of Cas9 or different types of Cas9 genes. And we can see which ones are actually driving through a population. And once a Cas9 gene has been detected, then the, assume the communities, of course, will be notified and then our company can produce an insert gene break and also HDR enhancing chemicals into whatever organism. We can grow that population higher in a factory, creating large numbers of populations, and then we can release that organism into the wild to overcome a threshold, the minimum threshold needed to take over a population. And that would in turn take out the Cas9 and stop the CRISPR-based, CRISPR-Cas9 based gene drive. Gene break as a whole, the goal is to reduce the burden on the economy and lower the rates of transmission that may be occurring within the population of people. It doesn't have to necessarily propagate in all the organisms, but some will do. And this would lead to a, a population alteration and replacement rather than a population suppression. So we're gonna label this as Cas9. And essentially all these burgundy mosquitoes are Cas9 carrying mosquitoes with whatever guide RNA, but the gene break, our gene break, would have a guide RNA that essentially outcompetes and replaces this population of Cas9 organisms slowly within a few generations. Now, this Cas9, uh, our transgenic gene break population could also be replaced by the reintroduction of a wild type mosquito or through natural selection over time, the gene break construct may confer no benefits and also be phased out in that way. Population alteration and replacement is also more favorable than population suppression, which other methods tend to rely upon. And population suppression could cause a cost cascade of effects that reverberate through the environment because there are less of this organism, whatever organism that may be, that can be targeted by a predator and that would not be advantageous. Quickly summarize what gene break is. It's a tool that can be used in Cas9 carrying organisms. So it's not gonna drive into uh, another organism. It's not gonna drive across a population unless it has Cas9, which would also be beneficial in case we didn't even know this organism had a Cas9 gene. It could also be used similarly in different organisms and it can also offer a potential line of defense against CRISPR-Cas9 based gene drives. And this is a novel population replacement or alteration strategy, but we do admit that there's plenty of areas left to research. So how could gene break fail? Well, as with any construct or method that's gonna be brought into the field, there are potential factors in the ecosystem that affect it such as weather, wind speeds, predation by other organisms, natural disasters, mating, maybe mating behaviors of the, the mosquito or whatever organism. Maybe there is hormones that affect, fluctuate during flight, infections that insert themselves into the genome causing different mutations. Maybe there's point mutations that can render a Cas9 gene invisible to the gene break. Maybe there's also introgression where whatever gene that's in Kacha can be uh, transferred into another organism that is unexpected. There, are, there could also be off-target effects from maybe or another repetitive site that arises within this organism. Moderate to low um, genomes can suffer from these off-target effects and that could result in decreased fitness or maybe excessive chromosomal breakage, which will lead to premature death of whatever organism. 
But the point of the matter is that we can potentially reverse the gene drive that can harm many people, the environment, or the economy. This gene break can save lives, it can save the environment, and it can also preserve the food chain. And this is also a very nice technology or idea that could be used in case of natural disasters that happen to these gene drive containing labs where maybe an earthquake was to happen and it ripped the lab in part where all the other organisms escaped into the environment. Now we have an uncontrolled release where tons of these organisms are driving their genes into the population, converting the population, com converting the environment. This can this gene break can also potentially stop international conflict as I was talking about earlier with the dispersal of GMOs, specifically CRISPR-Cas9 based gene drives that go across borders. So with all these issues and problems that uh, gene break may have, the benefits are surely there as I'll discuss on the next slide. But to minimize the amount of errors that could happen during a field trial with gene break, we could optimize the endonuclease that we use. We can also be very careful with designing the specific guide RNAs. We can also maximize DNA repair, as I was talking about, and add even more homology-directed repair enhancing chemicals or uh, effector genes. Here on this slide, I depict the risk versus the benefits of using genes, uh, gene break. So with the risk, it might not work in field trials. This presentation might not even be worth saying. There could also be off-target effects where the fitness could be lowered and the species would be inherently weaker. Maybe there's gene break resistance that occurred from maybe a point mutation. There can also be horizontal gene transfer where the genes of the gene break organism unexpectedly go to another organism. There could also be loss of a species. Maybe the gene break does not work at all as we expected. Maybe the gene break within an organism could change its resistance to certain pesticides, which should not be uh, beneficial for anybody. But on the other side of the spectrum, we have benefits such as potentially reversing a gene drive, potentially reducing the amount of transmission or saving lives. We can also save the environment offer something that we can use after natural disasters that affect gene drive containing labs. It can also mitigate conflicts of migrating GMOs with these Cas9 genes, but most importantly, it can also advance science. Putting all of these risks and these benefits and ways that we can lower the risk all into consideration, we can construct a TPP. A TPP is a target product profile where you can measure how well the gene drive construct is uptaken by the organism, so the gene break and how well it can become integrated into the organism. We can look at off-target effects such as their survivorship, how competitive they are in mating. We can look at the hybridization with other species, like are they able to you know, spread the gene break through other organisms, um, this impact, how long it will take for this impact to occur. And then these are all basically things where the funding of whoever funds us will be going into. And we can learn, we can also uh, spread the funding into how well we can deliver these gene breaks across the nation. We can use some of the funding to help uh, train employees on how to take care of these organisms, whatever they may be, because Whatever the organism may be will determine what kind of training do they need and what kind of qualification do they need. And then what kind of cost would it take for us to build a factory manufacturing this organism. And on the right side, we see the minimum threshold. So here are the goals basically for whatever uh, phase testing that will be done during each phase. And here are some of the goals that we will want to be doing. So we want most of the most of the uh, construct to be taken up by the organism. We want it in all the organisms. We want less than 1% over 10 generations. So we want it to go quickly through the generation so we can help save time. 
and we also go into how it can be delivered using existing health systems, uh, can be deployed by community volunteering, which I'll go into later on how that can be done, and if it meets the demand, does it actually satisfy everybody? Funding would go into the phase testing pathway where we can assess the fitness cost, the efficiency under certain factors, minimum threshold for fixation in the population, the transmission rate, whether that's affected, the hybridization with other species. But currently we're at phase one where we're developing the research plan and we're targeting our product profile with the stakeholders. And we're looking for funding so we can begin phase one. And this pathway will be followed once funding is received where we can get governmental approval during each step from like the NIH, CDC, EPA, USDA, and also other companies like NEPA. And we'll also be receiving constant feedback from the community, the public, and the stakeholders through community engagement. In addition to the uh, phase testing pathway and with the communication from stakeholders, from communities, from publics, governing bodies would be contacted for each step of the way. Um, communication is key with whatever biotechnology that's going to be used and definitely governance would help in that process as well as with any gene drive, specifically in plants, maybe rodents, would need to be contacting the IDC, gene drive in insects and animals, the IDC. And as the hazards go up or potential risk, that's just leading to more governmental contacts. But in this case, since this might be released in the US to potentially stop whatever organism that is driving through the population, the IDC would be contacted, also the FDA, the EPA, the USDA, and also CDC. The EPA would be contacted because their organization essentially ties into pesticide products and products that are intended to reduce a population. Even though we're not reducing a population, we are still replacing a population. And that would probably warrant EPA to come in and investigate or required to be contacted. The FDA would be contacted because animal it, this construct, gene break, could be considered an animal drug that is intended to reduce a virus or pathogen load within a mosquito. So if uh, this Cas9 was to drop, or oh, this gene break was to drive and inactivate a Cas9, that can reduce its ability to potentially transmit a virus. And it's also a product that is, that is intended to maybe prevent disease or maybe reduce or prevent a mosquito's ability to do transmit disease. So that would require FDA contact. The USDA could also come in as they intend to have control over more genetically modified insects as that deals with the agriculture. And the CDC could also be involved as they are in charge of essentially investigating outbreaks sources of illnesses. So say they uh, come across an outbreak that was caused by a CRISPR-Cas9 based gene drive where mosquitoes are able to transmit more diseases, then we can be deployed, but also the CDC will be deployed. So there also must be communication between both parties. And that's just an example of how all these organizations can come together with gene break and potentially do something about the situation. Once funding is received and approved from the IVC and maybe a feedback from stakeholders, communities, publics, and also the governing bodies was received, we could put all that together and create an insectary. And also in addition to a laboratory where the molecular biology can take place. Now, if this can be an insectary. It doesn't have to necessarily be an insectary. It could be a nursery for whatever animal that might be uh, modified through CRISPR-Cas9 based gene drive. But here's a general schematic of how these uh, nurseries or insectaries could be constructed. There's a place to rear the, mild, the wild type mosquitoes or whatever organism. Here's a place where 
You can rear the gene-driven organisms. And here's a workroom where some molecular biology can take place or the injections of these organisms with the construct that we're intending to use, which is gene break. Here's a vestibule, which will offer a way for organisms to not escape. So there's, so workroom would be the first way we can see if something has escaped. The vestibule will be the second layer to where we can see if something has escaped. And we can also see if something has escaped in the, within the corridor. And as we go from wherever we're coming from to the corridor, whether that be from the gene drive or the rearing room, we see that there's a lower and lower chance at an organism potentially escaping through the corridor, which would bode well for us and go well in our favor as we would not want any escapees of this gene break before it's actually done. So once the gene driven organism with the gene break has been properly reared, they would be shipped off to fact factories that will mass produce these gene break organisms by their specific line of uh, mosquito or whatever organism. So in this picture, we see um, sterilized insects. It's, a, it's the world's largest mosquito factory where they're rearing tons and tons of mosquitoes. And that's similar to what we would do, but not as massive. And in these factories, we would have trained staff to mass produce these organisms, to sex them, to mass rear them, to sex them, and also to deliver them. Once these mosquitoes have been mass reared, they have been sexed, they have been uh, PCR tested to see if they have the construct, that's when we would need personnel to release whatever organism that was uh, modified to have gene break. So that would also require funding for us to hire the personnel to be able to release these mosquitoes. And we also have to give them funding in order to travel to these areas of the world where they are being affected by a CRISPR-Cas9 based gene drive. And so in this image, we have someone releasing mosquitoes out of a bucket. And that's very uh, clever as we can potentially release say mosquitoes like in that same fashion. In addition to constructing the TPP, the target product profile, and also the phase testing pathway and the contacting of stakeholders, communities, publics, and also the governing bodies, and also the actual construction of the gene break modified organisms through mass rearing, sexing, and factory work and releasing. We would also do the monitoring of the environment, which would, a technique would be applied such like the mark release with capture. And this is a technique that is commonly used in ecology that has been done in other research studies and is used to estimate an animal's population size or whatever organism's population size within the environment because it's, it's impractical to count every individual. Say, for example, we were to go outside and want to uh, know the population of mosquitoes that are there. It's impractical just to catch all those mosquitoes because they're small and they're fast and they have a wide range. So it's impractical and is a waste of funding. So in this uh, mark and recapture and release, a portion of the mosquitoes will be captured, marked and released. And a later portion afterwards would also be captured. And then the, mum, the number of marked individuals would be counted. So we'll mark the mosquitoes or whatever organism with an, a marker gene that I was talking about earlier, release them into the environment, count how many marked ones we'll get back that first try, release them again, and then recapture later on. And then that would give us an estimation of the population size by dividing the proportion of marked individuals in the first trial by the number of individuals in the second sample. And in addition to this, the captured mosquitoes could also be sent off for PCR monitoring for the presence of the gene break construct and how it's doing, the stability of it. After all that being said, 
the most important aspect of the gene break in and success is going to be determined by community engagement, as well as the presence of funding, of course. So as a situation occurs, community occasion, engagement could be um, built. It could be introduced on the news or by us or via a spokesman, a spokesperson that a selected area has been affected by this CRISPR-Cas9 gene-based or gene drive-based organism. And the design of gene break of this gene break would be pending on the feedback from stakeholders, publics, and the communities affected. So it's like the community is building this new gene break construct as well as us all together. And we can do this community engagement through social media, community meetings, school lectures, door to door. But the point of the matter is, is that we can educate and provide uh, reasonings for why gene break is a good idea. We can teach them how it works and why it's an effective method and why it's not something that we can choose not to do because what other method would prevent CRISPR-Cas9 based gene drive from spreading through the environment without killing all of that organism off. Another way that community engagement could be expressed through the schools is by making a gene break mosquito pill. And so on the left side, we see a pill that was um, crudely drawn or like constructed from Google Images. And the little black circles that we see are just each mosquito embryo. In this case, this is, this is the organism that has been modified for unintended purposes. And the kids simply just placed this pill in a cup of water or whatever standing body of water and allow for these mosquitoes to essentially hatch. Of course, they're going to be in the larval stage, the pupil stage, but that will all be explained to the parents and the children, and then they can witness all these cycles, but we're going to advise that they do this all outside, but this is just another way to where um, the, the community can also help the boy. So to sum up gene break into one complete picture, we can describe gene break as a way to combat misused or unintentional releases of CRISPR-Cas9 based gene driven organisms. We also know from this idea that there is great potential based on previous research for this technology to work very well within the field and efficiently. We also know that this can be applied to a variety of organisms due to the fact that CRISPR-Cas9 is very diverse with what it can target. And we also know that this technology can provide a way for the public to feel more comfortable about CRISPR-Cas9 being used globally. Because as with time comes progress, inevitably, and gene break is a way for people to feel more and more secure about their safety and well-being and we have to take these human values into consideration as any biotechnology is to be pushed forward um, thank you for listening this has been benjamin thomas if you have any questions please leave them down in the comments below or sip them off to my secretary or assistants and thank you for your time once again this has been a long video and I appreciate all your listening.